Well, hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. Our job here is to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season, be it first team players, staff management or key academy personnel. For those who are new to our podcast, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. Today, I'm privileged to be in the company of AFC Bournemouth's encyclopedia of knowledge as Neil Parrott joins me once again. Neil, it's great to see you. It's been a busy few weeks here at Vitality Stadium. It's been a fantastic month. April, five wins out of seven games. Safety, all but assured for another season in the Premier League. It's been a really, really memorable month. Three consecutive away wins as well in the Premier League for the first time in our history. What a time to be a Cherries fan. Not as successful for your non-league team, though. No, sadly, New Milton Town, who my dog Lazaro is a big sponsor of, lost their penalty shootout playoff promotion final on Saturday. So that was disappointing. <laughs> well, we'll move on for that from that because we've got a really exciting guest today and I have no doubt we'll be in fits of laughter over the next hour or so. Now we're going to be talking to the man of the moment who's taken the Premier League by storm this season. He's already loved by AFC Bournemouth fans and has settled right in on the South Coast. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Marcus Tavernier onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Marcus, it's great to see you. How are you? How are things? How's the injury? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling great at the moment. Obviously, a bit frustrating with uh, picking up another injury, but waiting to hear what the, the specialist says and hopefully it comes back with some good news. Marcus, I interviewed you after you'd scored the winning goal against Southampton last month. And um, before we went live, you said, can you just see if I've got any bits in my teeth? Because if my mum sees, and I have, she'll be furious with me. So can you just please smile for the camera? I'm smiling. I, I, don't, I didn't check my teeth before I came, so I'm, I'm hoping that there's nothing in them. <laughs> Let's keep on the family theme. Now, we know your brother James is the captain of Rangers. Just, just tell us about your mum. This is the first time you've lived away. You've told us that. Has she missed you? Have you missed her? Yeah, 100%. I get messages every day asking how I am, what what I'm up to. It's like she still wants me back at home and I'm still there because obviously I'm the youngest child. She, I, I say she she loves me more than, than my brother. I might say that. I might, my brother might say that I got it easier back at home. But yeah, she's she's missing me and she tries to get down as much as she can. And she was, she's been down a couple of weeks ago. So it's good to have her when, she, when she's down. But then she's got me doing jobs around my own house. Let's give her a quick name check. Uh, that's Bernie. Lovely. Now, home being Newcastle, the family home is in Newcastle. Do you, do you get back there much at all? I know you can fly there quite easily from Southampton. Yeah, well, it's, I've probably picked the, the first place to move away to in the in the country, but I try and go back as, as much as I can. And But at the moment this season, I've just been really focused on my on my football. And I can't, it's kind of bad to say it's, I didn't want it to be a distraction to go back home. So I left that aside at, at times and gone back home for for birthdays of my of my nieces and nephews and and being around my my friends when I've been back up there but I've just been focused really on on football this season and trying to really knuckle down on it how big an influence has brother James been on you throughout your career yeah he's been massive I remember when I was younger and I got I got released from from Newcastle at under 14s and I remember probably one of the worst days I, I had as a as a as a child but I remember in me he took me to side and, and said, if this is really what I want, if this is what I want to be, make sure you put your 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 eggs all in all in one basket. And, and that's what I did. And he just made me dedicate myself to it and really, really made me believe that this is what I want to do. And I've never looked back since. Do you get to see him much play live? I, um, I try to. I think the last game I went to was his European final in, in Seville. And that's probably the last time I've... I've been a, a proper fan in a game. It's it made me bring back memories from my childhood of of going to watch games and having that enjoyment of of supporting the team. And it was unfortunately he, he didn't get the win, but I couldn't be more proud of him to achieve what he has so far. Now, as Neil said before this season, apart from a brief spell in Milton Keynes, you never lived away from home. How have you found it? Have you settled in on the south coast and explored the area at all? Yeah, definitely. I've got to give big thanks to. Jordan Zamora and Jane Anthony for, for that. I remember when I first came down, I had already seen uh, Jordan in Dubai in the holidays, funny enough, and we were training out there a little bit. So when I came here, it was like, first set of eyes I, I seen it, someone I recognised. So they invited me over straight away for, for food and to watch some football and made me made me settle in really easy. And I think that's played a big a big factor in, 
in me doing doing well and settling settling down because you hear about the stories of of players finding it hard to to find their feet when they when they move away from from where they used to so much now when you first arrived in Dorset I'm going to quote you you said moving here it was time for me to have a change and start my own adventure in life how's it going it's going great. I mean, the weather's so much more better down here. I remember speaking to my my mom the other day, and it was sunny down here, and I'm enjoying the sun. I went on a nice walk, and I asked her, oh, "What what have you done today?" She she's telling me the weather the weather's bad up there. It's raining, and I couldn't be a bit more happy than than to hear that. To be honest. Now let's go back to where it all started: Newcastle United. You were born in Leeds, but your first club was Newcastle. Just tell us how that all came about. So my, um, I moved to. To Newcastle when I was when I was five with my with my mum working and then started playing football locally uh, as you do and I remember my mum telling me that my, I've got I've got scouts watching me from Newcastle and I was probably the most excited kid you you'll ever meet and I remember I got brought into the into the development at a young age and I stayed in the system for a long time and made some friends for life from up there who who are still my friends today and. It was a really, a really good time for me. I really enjoyed it up there and I enjoyed every moment of it and it's played a big part of my life. You just touched on being released and that day when that fateful day when you were told, just give us your memories of how did it come about? Would they sit you down or how does it all work? Well, for, for me personally, um, it, was a, it was my mum got a phone call. It probably wasn't in the, in the best way it got, it got handled. I remember, I think I was still training at the time and my mum got a phone call and they waited until I got home and then sat me down. My mum sat me down and and told me that they've uh, they've let you go. And you know what happens in football? These are these are things which 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 do happen. But if anything, I think it it helped me become a professional footballer. I feel like if that didn't happen, I I don't know if I would be sat here with you guys today and and speaking about this. So I don't look at it as a negative. I look at everything as a as a positive. And um, in a way, it's. It's worked out well for me as I moved on to, to Middlesbrough and had a great great time there as well. Yeah, I think it was a couple of weeks later you were spotted by Middlesbrough playing in a county match. Just tell us about that. Yeah, I remember straight away when I, obviously when you, you get released, you, I just wanted to get straight back into football. So I joined joined the boys club, played a couple of tournaments. I remember representing the the county as well. And it was, it was a final game against... Um, a team in, uh, I think it was Middlesbrough County, believe it or not. And then I seen one of the coaches from Middlesbrough before the game and he was just wishing me all the best. And because uh, I think he worked, we played at a school, so he was just, luckily enough, he, it was at the same time and I'd seen him, ran into him. I was like, oh, I'll come watch the first first 20 minutes of the game. And probably in the first 20 minutes, I scored one of the best goals I've ever scored in my life. And then he must have been on the phone straight away and, and brought me in. Now, you had a couple of games for the under-23s at Borough in 2016 before you made your first-team debut against Scunthorpe United in the EFL Cup. Now, you were 18 and you provided the assist for the third goal. Give us your memories of that day and the sort of build-up, if you like, and finding out you're in the team and what have you. I remember that day like it, like it was yesterday, even the, the training session before. We had Gary Monk as a manager and he used to do... If we had a nighttime game the next day, we would train on the nighttime before. And obviously we went into the into the meeting the the day before, and I'm I'm straight away I'm looking at the bench, seeing have I, have I made the bench, and I couldn't see my name, so I was a bit bit gutted. Then I looked a bit higher up, and I seen that I was that I was starting. And I couldn't believe it. And then all the little all the moments of joy just came in my body. I trying to keep a straight face while he's trying to tell us tactics, but at the same time I'm just smiling so much on the inside. So he trains, and then I remember after I was still so so happy. And I was really good friends, really good friends still to this day with uh, Lewis Wing and uh, Dale Fry. So they, they were really happy for me as well. And I remember coming out the training ground, Dale, Dale had blocked me in and just joking, like shouting out of the car, well done, this is what you deserve. And he just stayed behind me for ages, tried to, uh, tried to annoy me over, over welcome to stay. I remember I reversed out and put my foot down and I ended up hitting Wingy's car <laughs> the day before a game and I kept that a secret for months and months. I remember him coming back in one day and saying, I've got a scratch on my car and, I, and I'm looking, I'm going, oh, how's, how's that happened? I, I know I, I tried to play it cool, like nothing happened. I remember telling him maybe, maybe a year or so later, I said, oh, you remember back when you had that scratch on your car? That's, that, that was me. <laughs> so it was a great build up to it. And then 
to go to the game to to the next day and it was a long wait because it's a nighttime game so I couldn't just I just wanted to go down early and get ready for the game and have all my family there and all so proud of me to to get there my brother came down and everyone came up to watch me and it was a it was a great day for me it was a, it was a day I'll never forget. Now in October 2017 you scored your first goal for the first team and it was against the Cherries here in the EFL Cup. What were your first impressions of Vitality Stadium? I bet back then you couldn't envisage you know you'd be making your Premier League debut here. No back then if you told me I, I was going to be playing for Bournemouth uh, I probably wouldn't have believed it I didn't didn't think anything of it but that that day is I would say that feeling I got when I when I scored that goal is is a feeling you can't describe it's not something you can put into words in how you feel. I remember Adama running with the ball and then I'm screaming at him as loud as I can on the left side and he slides me in. And then I remember just taking a touch and I see Steve Cook coming across and I just hit the ball, hit the ball across goal and look up and see it goes back in the net. And the feeling was just, just surreal. And if I could go back to that moment again, that, that's the one I would definitely go back to. Is it a different feeling scoring your first goal to scoring a goal now or is it the same feeling you have? No, definitely different. I don't think any feeling will will come to the same as, as scoring your first goal because it feels like all that work since you were a kid when you're playing in the street and pretending you're a, you're a player. For me, it was Thierry Henry pretending I was him and, and scoring a goal and to do that yourself. And it's just an amazing feeling, an amazing feeling for myself. Now your first goal in the championship, it was a pretty memorable one. It was the winner in the derby against Sunderland in front of a crowd of almost 30,000 people at the Riverside. It was fireworks night, 2017. That must have made you a, a Middlesbrough hero. Yeah, I think that's what made me, uh, made me a fan favourite early doors and I definitely got remembered for that. I remember that was my, my first home start. So that was my first home start in the, in the championship. So it was first time playing there during the day and having a, an early kickoff and, and getting used to that. and. I remember the build up to the game, going to the ground, all the all the fans there and I've only ever been a fan at them type of games and to play in it was was a great experience and to top it off with with a goal just just made it so much more real. I remember I was meant to have a celebration in mind to do, but then forgot everything and just enjoyed the moment. We'll come on to your goal celebrations later, but your <laughs> your goalkeeper that day played quite well, I believe. Yes, that's Darren Randolph, yeah. He got man of the match that day, I'll never forget that. Um, the, uh, I don't know who it was. Someone, one of someone from Sky asked Grant Ledbetter, "Oh, who who do you think we should give man the match to?" And I'm I've came off at this point. And I'm sat next to him, and I can I'm I'm, I'm listening to him thinking he's because he's gone. Oh, should we give it to the to the young lad or shall we give it to Darren? And I and I was listening and thinking he's got to say me. Come on, he's got to say my name. I'm a young lad, first home game, scored the winner against against uh, our rivals and. Fortunately enough, he said, Darren, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe he had said it, but he played great that day and he was a great keeper for, for Middlesbrough while he was there. Nice to have a familiar face when you come into a football club. You said about that earlier. What's it been like to see him here as well? Yeah, it's great. I mean, he keeps telling me I've got a lot older now, but I make sure I tell him he's got a lot older. He's definitely, he, well, he's bald back then, so I can't really say, I can't really say too much. He hasn't grown much hair since then either, but it's great for, for a player to have a, a familiar face in help someone settle down and you can tell them what the area is like and give an honest honest opinion. Now, in December 2017, Gary Monk, the man who gave you that first team debut, was sacked due to concerns about the club's style of play, or so it was reported. What 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 were your feelings on that? That one uh, really probably probably hurt me quite a lot because um, obviously he's the first manager who put, put faith in me and really believed in me and in my in my ability and he, he made sure to tell me many many times and told me always to work hard and the the sky's the limit for me and when I got the news that he had, he had got sacked it it was a it was a shock for me because we were doing well well at the time I remember we were going into the game and we hadn't scored a, a I think it was a set piece goal or we hadn't came back from being behind and that game we had done the both exact two things what we hadn't done all season so it was a big surprise for for me and I don't know for the team I can only speak for myself but I've got to give him a lot of a lot of credit for for making me become a, the player I am today as he as he pushed me hard. Ex Cherries boss Tony Poulis arrived and quickly shipped you out on loan to MK Dons. Just tell us about how that move came about. Now I know that you'd spoken to. 
teammates Patrick Bamford and Lewis Baker who'd been there and I know your brother also had a loan spell there. Yeah, I remember as a player you want to you want to play games and you want to just be on the pitch doing doing what you love so much and unfortunately that wasn't happening at Middlesbrough there were a team full of full of great players and some with some managers they they love you and some managers they they might not play you so it's part of the game and I understood that with the help of my brother he made me realize that so I remember having the a talk with my agent and telling him that I, I want to just go play football and and enjoy enjoy football and there was a couple of couple of um, options there for me but the best one was MK Dons as I could speak to like you said, Patrick Bamford and Lewis Baker, and most importantly my brother, who, who had been there as well, to to see what the the club's about, how they like to to go about things, and it was a good. It, it wasn't the probably the best best loan spell for me. I remember getting injured and having my first long injury as a as a as a player there, and unfortunately we got we got relegated, which is is not the best thing, and, and that's not what I intended to do there. I intended to to go there and be the savior as you want to be, but that didn't work out. But it made me. It made me grow up very quickly, moving moving away to to Milton Keynes, away from what I'm used to and and things like that. So it was a it was a great experience for me. Now you had a full season under Tony Pulis in 2018-19. What was he like to work under for that that duration of that campaign? Yeah, he was he, he was good. You can see why he's been successful for the majority of his career. He was he was, he was tough to work with at the same time, but I understood that. I, it's my first time transitioning really from managers so it was a lot different from the the manager had previously but it made me like I said before become a man it made me grow even more I feel like I grew up really really early in in my football career and and with him it it, it made that part always kept me on my on my toes wanting to to push to get into the team I remember going in the office asking asking why I'm not playing and things like that and he just gave me honest answers and that uh, you can't argue with that. When someone's honest with you, you can just hold your hands up and, and work hard and, and try and get back in that team. Now you're capped by England at under 19 and under 20 level and you also got to train with the full England squad as well. Just tell us about that experience and how brilliant it must have been. Yeah, that's probably one of the, the greatest moments for me to... I remember when I received the, the call from, from England to go, to go play. It was due to some players being um, injured. I was on standby for couple of times beforehand and just missed out but this time someone got injured and I got that that phone call and I remember just being so excited it's you're going with the the best players in in your age group in the in the in the country so it was a great great moment for me and to to play with my my country and I got the honor to to captain them in a in a few games which was which was even better and then to top it all off I got to Challenge myself with the the best players in the in the country who are playing week in week out in the in the Premier League, and when I got that that taste of training with them, it's it's when I realised that's what that's where I want to be, and that's that's what my aim is. What's it going to take to break into that full England squad? You know, it's we've got such an amazing team at the moment, lots of young talent, and you know, for you, it must clearly be an ambition. Yeah, definitely, that's always been a a goal of mine. I feel like if I score some more goals, like against Fulham, I might I might get a bit more on the radar. But no, I've just got to keep working hard and continuing to put performances on the pitch and then focus on the club and then I'm sure good things will come from that. Just going back to Milton Keynes, it's it's, it's a funny sort of place because they don't have road names, they're all numbers. How did you get on with all of that? It was a very strange experience when I first went, I remember. I, I heard it, my brother told me there's there's a lot of roundabouts there and I'm thinking, why, why are you telling me that? I don't know don't know what you're on about. It's, that doesn't mean anything to me. And then when I got there, I, did, I didn't have a clue where I was driving. I was going around the wrong roundabouts. I'm not the best driver in the world. So I, I remember a couple of first days I was I was turning up late because I generally didn't know where I was going. And that's following a sat-nav. So if a sat-nav can't help you out, what can? <laughs> Now, in a COVID hit 2019-20, you flourished under none other than Jonathan Woodgate, another man who's been sat in that chair. We did a podcast with him. Hugely popular guy here when he was at AFC Bournemouth. Just tell us about working with him and what he was like. Yeah, he was he was great. I remember when he took over and, and, and got the job, I was delighted inside because I knew he was under, he worked under Tony Pulis and he was probably the, the coach I spoke to the most and was asking... Well, that's, go away, Junior. <laughs> go. <laughs> Junior Stanislas has come to interrupt us. No, but I remember 
Jonathan Woodgate coming in and and when he took over the job, I, I was really delighted as someone I spoke to a lot and asked for advice for. And I remember him telling me, um, asking me, I thought it was a pressure question before the season started. I'd just been away with uh, England. And he asked me um, if I wanted to come back early or or have a have an extra week off. So it was a bit of a trick question, you know, as <laughs> so I chose the, the the to come back a week early and he told me he had uh, big plans for me in the season and as a player that's that's all you want to hear. You want to hear that you're you're valued and you're important and he, he stayed true to his word and played me the most I've I've played in, in, in one season as a young as a young player. You certainly played under some very big characters, none other than Neil Warnock being the next one. <laughs> Come on, you must have some stories about him. He's one of my one of my favourite managers I've had. Definitely, I think he's the best man manager you can you can ever well well I've ever had so far. He's he may, he'll make you want to run through a, a brick wall for him, and he's very he's very very relaxed person. I think he's changed from from his uh, his younger days, and but he just loves football and and he's a very family orientated man. So for pre season, he'll take the team to Cornwall and then. You bring everyone over to his house to meet his family and and meet his children. So I feel like he's a he's a great manager and he's he's good at what he does and that's why he's still been in the game for so long. Chris Wilder was your last manager at, at Middlesbrough. Now you're still young, but you were even younger then. You seem to have having to keep proving yourself to different managers all the time. What's that like for a young player? I think it's good. I mean, it keeps you on your on your toes. I believe. I feel like as a young player, you you want. You want the world at your feet at the same time, but it doesn't come easy. You've got to continue to work hard because you see players, young players who have all the ability in the world and they they never amount to it. So it's always good to have managers always pushing you and wanting more from you from a young player. And that's what I had and I'm, I'm lucky for it. Now, no sooner had you arrived at Vitality Stadium, another manager departed and another one came in and you almost had to prove yourself to another boss. How have you found working under Gary O'Neill? Yeah, he's been great. I remember when I was going through a a sticky spell, not not getting any numbers in terms of goals and assists, and he he brought me into the office to have a have a talk with him, and he just told me to keep believing in myself, keep doing the things I'm doing, and and all and all all the other things that I'm wanting will come. And then that's when I got my on that same week I got my my first goal, and it was a it was a great moment for myself, but. I feel like he's he's done a great he's done a great job and it's it showed in the in the previous performances and you can really see the style of play and the way the way we want to go about things in the games that we've been playing recently. Just going back to last summer and the move, just tell us a little bit more about how it came about because I know it was rumored for a while and it must have been nice for you just to get it over the line. Yeah, it was rumored for a long time. I feel like uh, my agent told me I think it was back in 2019 when Bournemouth were originally just just interested. And I always thought I'm. I don't want to hear if a team's interested. If they're gonna, if they if they want me, they'll 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 put a bid in. And, and I always knew that the the interest was there. But in the season, when I when my agent told me that Bournemouth are, are going to put a bid in and they really want this to to work, it was just a, a smile on smile to my face. As as a young child, all I've ever wanted to do is play in the Premier League. And I remember speaking to the to the manager at the time and. Once I got off that phone call, I just knew straight away that I was I was going to come down here. Were you nervous? No, not really. I feel like I'm quite laid back in things like that, and I trust in my my own ability, and uh, I back that all the way. And it's all down to me then. If if I don't perform, it's not no one else's fault but myself. But thankfully, it's worked out so far. Well, that Premier League debut of yours against Aston Villa—it was the opening day. It couldn't have gone much better, could it? I think you got man of the match. Yeah, it was a it was a great debut. I mean, I'd only been here. I think uh, maybe 10 days or so leading up to the game and there was a lot of information put in from the manager and the and the staff but they made it easy for me to understand to to get in terms with the the team and that's why I say about settling down quickly and with Jordan and Jaden made me making me settle down so that played a big big part in in me performing well on the day and and then it was a great start to the season we we got a 2-0 win and I had me questioning is the Premier League it might not all be this it might, it might not as be as hard as I thought it was but then we had a tough tough three games which made my eyes open up to, to the league after that I'm going to talk to you about one of those tough three games now your first visit to Anfield ended in disappointment when you went to watch your brother play in the FA Youth Cup and he didn't come off the bench your second visit ended in a 9-0 defeat what was going through your head as you walked off the pitch after that? 
I just couldn't believe it. I didn't I didn't want to believe it. It was just a, a moment no player wants to wants to feel. You're at the, the highest level and no one expects any team in this division to get beat at a score that much. So I think everyone involved with the club felt the same that, that I was feeling that day and we just had to put things right and try and forget about it because we knew coming into the season that there's gonna be a lot of highs and lows in in during the season, but that was a law that that was unacceptable. It was, it was, but I feel like that was the the pinnacle point in our season. It made us become stronger, everyone more together in in terms of driving towards the same goal. Premier League safety must have looked a long way off after that game. Yeah, well, we have to take it. We had to take it a game at a time. When it's a, it's a long season, you play thirty eight games, and we knew that that's the coming into the league. We had. We had Aston Villa, then three of the, the top teams in, in the league straight after that, which wasn't the, the easiest start to a season. But I feel like as the season's gone on, gone on we've only got, got stronger and we've started to show our identity in the league. And Gary O'Neill came in and steadied the ship immediately with that six-game unbeaten run. Just tell us about that. Yeah, that's exactly probably what we needed at, at that time. We needed to start picking up some points and he made that very very much easy for us to for us to do he he helped us just get that belief back in back in the team and and that's what and that's what showed in in them six games and but at the same time we couldn't get too high on that because we knew that anything can happen in this league at any time so we had to just level ourselves out and just be ready for the next game continuously so every footballer craves scoring their first premier league goal is it fair to say that your second Premier League goal against Everton was perhaps more memorable than the one against Leeds, which came in a defeat? Uh, I'd probably say not, because obviously I was born in Leeds, had family at the game and it was just uh, the right moment for me to, to score my goal. And I'm sure I had some chances in the previous games before that to, to put the ball in the back of the net, but I remember scoring and then unfortunately getting beat in, in the same sense from a, from a good lead. and. It was a bittersweet moment for my for myself as I've just want to be delighted that I've scored my my first goal. But at the same time, we've 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 lost a, another game and it was it was tough at the time. But we had to bounce back and then I don't know if it was a week or two weeks later we played played Everton and we put things right and and got got that win and and, and got my other goal, which in front of the the home fans for the first time, which was which was great. You were a Middlesbrough hero for scoring in the derby against Sunderland and you were certainly a Bournemouth hero for scoring the goal against Southampton recently. Just tell us, did you really know how much that meant to, to Bournemouth fans? Not, if I'm being brutally honest, not till, not till going to the game and after the game and being involved in it. But I remember the first, the first time we played them here and when we, we got beat, I remember after the game hearing their fans and seeing their their players go up to them at the end of the game. It, it really annoyed me. It's, it's not what you want. It made me realise that this this is a big game for for these two sets of fans, and we had to put things right. And the in the in the second second time we played them, and which we did, and it made it ever so better that we did it at their place as well. And we it was a better win, and it was probably the, one of the biggest wins that we we've had all season. And it's been an interesting scenario here this season, having Jack Stevens here on loan from Southampton. He obviously couldn't play in those two games, but that, that must be an interesting dynamic for him. Yeah, yeah, it probably is so, but I'm sure he's he's rooting for us as as much as, as anything because he's a Bournemouth player at the moment and that's that's where he sees his head out. So after the game, he's came in congratulating, congratulating everyone because we knew what that game meant for us and we knew how vital them three points were. Now, while we're on the subject of the Southampton game and the Southampton goal, you know what's coming. I can tell by your face that I'm about to ask you about the celebration. Yeah, what dance do you think it is first before we go on? So I know the answer, so I think well, before it's Before you unfair. knew the answer though, what did you think it was? To be honest, at the time, my head was down tapping away. I saw you score and I was like, oh, I need to put a tweet out here. So I actually didn't see it at the time. Because I've been getting a lot of people calling it the chicken dance, the duck dance, but it is it's the turkey dance. <laughs> <laughs> it's a turkey dance because my family, my uncle and auntie were down for the for the game and I went to their room before the game. They were staying at the same hotel and my auntie always makes me turkey sandwiches whenever she sees me. And my uncle gave me the message at about three o'clock saying, oh, 
you want to come up for some turkey sandwiches? <laughs> and I can't turn that offer down. So I remember going up just before pre-match and going to the room and having a, a cup of tea and turkey sandwich and I even stuck a donut in there as well. I Sports scientist probably not going to be the happiest with that, but I remember taking a donut as well. And I remember after I ate and I was going down for, just before I was going to go down for, for pre-match, my uncle said, if, if you score today, you've got to promise me that you've got to do a, a turkey dance. And I said, I promise you I'm going to score today. And it, and when I do, you'll you'll see it. And he was in the Southampton end at the time. <laughs> he was in a, one of the players' box up there. So he was running around the box doing the turkey dance as well at the same time. <laughs> Are you a superstitious kind of guy? Because if you are, I mean, that's a turkey sandwich and a donut before every game, is it not? I probably won't get away with that though with the, <laughs> the small scientist. I'm, my auntie can be the only person who, who makes me the, the turkey sandwiches. There's a certain way you've got to make it and she makes it the best. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot. Which teammates have the best and worst goal celebrations? Bearing in mind, one of your teammates has sat in the room. Oh, no, no. He's, he's got a very good celebration, Junior. He's got a very good celebration. He's... But the best, I've got to give it to, I'm giving it to Jaden. Jaden, Jaden's the creator. He's, he's, he's a big creator and we always have, have talks on, on what we're going to do. And I'm sure you've seen the celebration after, I did about four celebrations in the Southampton game and we talked, it was like when you go out to check the pitch before, before the game, we, we talked about it. And I remember saying, if I score, I need you over next day. We're going to, going to celebrate this one like this way. And, He's definitely probably, I'd say he's the best creator, but I might put myself up there for the best, best one who's got the best celebrations, even though I knee slided for four of them. <laughs> <laughs> what about the worst? You haven't answered the worst goal celebration. The worst goal celebration. Um, I don't think there's a worst. I don't think, well, I mean, we haven't, we haven't scored as many goals as we like, so we, there's not been too many goal scorers, so I can't, can't give it a worst one now. Now we'll move on from Southampton. There's been so many highs and so many lows. I just want you to sum up the season, really. We haven't even mentioned that goal against Fulham, which must be one of your highs. Um, I feel like right right now at this point, it's it's gone great because we're nearly at that point where we've all been working working towards, and that's all I wanted to to do to come here. We we had a we had one job, and that's to to stay in this league. And although you can think of a personal level, it was always to me about the team and. To get to get that safety and to to stay in this league for many years to come and and that's what that's what we've uh, nearly achieved so so far. So I believe that's probably the the highest point so far. And then the lowest personally is injuries. That's something I haven't had too much in my in my career. But I feel like every every setback always always makes you makes you greater. And um, I've I've had Junior as a as a mentor to that to be fair. He's always kept me on the on the right track when when injuries have come my way and gave me that motivation to to con continue to do good when I come back. We'll um we'll, we'll get a move on because it looks like Junior's nodding off over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can't choose any of your goals. Choose a goal of the season winner. Dangle against Tottenham. It's not the actual goal but the moment itself was just unbelievable. I remember I was on the bench and I had felt like I scored. I was ready to to run on the pitch, and we've got the medical team and everyone in the inside the stadium supporting a bomb, supporting Bournemouth, celebrating like like our lives depend on it. It was just such a great feeling to 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 go to a top team at a crucial stage in our season and and get three points. What do you do in your spare time? I lo I love Call of Duty. I love to play Call of Duty. That's my. I like to tell everyone that football is just my, my hobby and Call of Duty is my, my full-time job. But apart from that, I like to just sit on the sofa like a normal person and watch TV. There's this story knocking around about Ben White saying how he doesn't like watching football. It's his, it's his job. You're not one of those sort of people, are you? No, no, no. I like to, I like to watch football and keep up to date with what's going on in the, in the league and, and the top teams. You, you, as, ever since I was young, I used to to watch players and see why they're why, why they're so great and what they do, which is different to what I do, what, what I can implement in my game. So I do like to watch football. I know some really picturesque areas in and around Newcastle, particularly north of Newcastle. Have you found anywhere like that where you go around here, maybe into the forest or the Purbex or anything like that yet? No, I was being telling Zoe that I need a dog. 
I need a dog to to go on a walk, but I can't look after it for <laughs> for for the times we 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 go away and um but the best place I go is probably just walking around when I was at the Nicky, I used to go to the to the beach when I had family down or go to a local coffee shop with with junior as well. Now, me and you have had a conversation about co-parenting a dog. I take it that's off the cards now? Yeah, I can't co-parent. It needs to be it needs to be my dog, but I don't want to give it away at the same time. It needs to be mine. And I don't know if you, what you're like with dogs. I don't know if I can trust you. you. I don't know. I mean, ask David Brooks. I look after his dog all the time. So I might have to speak to Brooksy, but he might just be nice saying that to you. He Maybe. might say something else to me. That's why I've not spoke to you about it since. You never know. You're trying to second guess <laughs> me now. <laughs> Now, is it true you're going to be gunning for Luton Town to win the Championship playoffs? Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. I've been rooting for Middlesbrough all season. And just because obviously I've got a lot of friends there and ultimately I want to play against them next season. It'll be a great experience to, to go back to a club I, I grew up playing for and came through the ranks and to, to go back there. It'll be interesting to see what, what reception you get because you never know what you're going to get as a player. But... I'm hoping they, they can stay strong in the in the playoffs and, and, and come up. We've got some fans' questions to move on to, but we're just going to ask you for your 10 favourites. So I'll start with the first five. Your favourite holiday destination? I'm going to say Dubai. Dubai? Yeah. Your favourite other sport? Basketball. Your favourite boxer? Oh, Floyd Mayweather. Is that what we're doing, retired or current? Well, go for retired and current. So retired Floyd Mayweather, current Javante Davis. Your favourite actor or actress? Denzel Washington. And your favourite flavour of ice cream? Vanilla. No, no sprinkles, no, no jam or whatever it is, just straight vanilla. Now your favourite film or series? Oh, Game of Thrones. It's the best ever. If you haven't seen it, go watch it right now. Your favourite away stadium to play at? Oh, I didn't get to play there. So is it one I've played at or? Again, give both. So to play at would be Emirates, because mm -hmm. growing up I was a, an Arsenal fan, but the best away one I've played at, St. James Park. Your favourite player, perhaps someone that you've never played with? Paul Pogba. Yeah, I used to love him just growing up. Favourite takeaway? Junior's Mrs. Food. <laughs> <laughs> The best. If you need some Caribbean food, she needs to she needs to create a business and she'll be she'll be a multimillionaire if she does. Your favourite performance this season that you've played in personally? My favourite one. Um There's probably two. <laughs> uh, I'd give it to the Leeds one on a personal personal level. It's probably the best game I I probably played. But the other one, I would say Fulham for coming back from my, my injury and making an impact in the game. I'd probably say that was that was my probably my fa favourite one as well. And it's, doesn't doesn't go too bad when you when you score a goal. So got some fans' questions just to finish off with. Jake Stokes is asking: Has the move to Bournemouth been what you hoped it would be? I'd probably say it's been better. I didn't didn't know what to to really expect. Obviously, I I've came here to to play football but I didn't know that I was going to be loved by the fans straight away or how they would they would take to me and the the players I couldn't have asked for a bit of bunch of teammates to to help me settle down and, and create friends with. Sam is asking what is your favourite thing about the town of Bournemouth? The town of Bournemouth I would go with the coffee shop me and Junior go to it's the best coffee I've ever I never used to really drink coffee and until I until I came here and that coffee shop does the best vanilla latte ever. So for free coffee for the rest of your life, which one is it? From this place, what it's called? Yeah. Ounce. Okay. Henry Smith is saying, why are you such a baller? <laughs> I don't know. I think my, my mum and dad might have the, the right genes in, in, create, in creating the, <laughs> a good footballer. I don't know, because obviously my brother's not doing too bad as well. So you'll have to speak to my mum and dad. Cassie wants to know, what's your favourite tattoo? Oh, my tattoos. Hmm. I don't know if I've got a favourite one. Maybe, I don't know, no, I don't know. I don't think I can pick just one. I like all of them. Everyone mean, has a meaning behind them, so I can't just pick one of them. 
And Joanne, we sort of touched on this. She wants to know if you've got a dog, which we found out that you don't. But if you did, what breed would you get? Chow Chow. <laughs> well, there we go, Joanne. A Chow Chow is what Marcus would have. Well, Marcus, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us. We've loved hearing your stories and loved your company this afternoon. Thank you very much for your time. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we'd love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it the AFC Bournemouth related or just the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Marcus Tavernier and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.